ready to explore the extraordinary world of tech. Welcome to the XTech Podcast, where we connect you with the sharpest minds and leading voices in the global tech community. Join us as we cut through the complexity to give you a clear picture of the ideas, innovations, and insight that are shaping our future. Hello, and welcome to the X Tech Podcast by Fox Agency. I'm your host, Debbie Forster, MBE. I'm the CEO at the Tech Talent Charter and an advocate and campaigner for diversity, inclusion, and innovation in the tech industry. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Jason Elliott. He's the Cross Portfolio Solutions and Ecosystem Marketing Head at Nokia. Jason, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure, Debbie. Nice to meet you with you and talk with you today. Thanks. So, Jason, for our listeners, you know, there's lots we want to cover, but uh, we like to try and get to know you as a human first before we talk about what you do. And we're fascinated with how people get into tech. Some people are born with that laptop in, in hand. Others take that really curly way to get in. How about you? How did you get into tech? I think I've always been interested in technology. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, growing up in the UK, uh, and I'm going to date myself here. Uh, for those of you who remember the ZX81 and the ZX Spectrum, oh, yeah. right from the very, very early days of like trying to think about computers, and um, yeah, so it's always been interesting, inspiring to me, and and the technology was one key aspect of it, and what you could do with the technology. And actually combining it with um, people and the social aspect was really interesting to me as well. Even in the early days of gaming, even when they weren't online, um, just the sheer fact of like other people were playing the same games and you could like talk to each other about the games and what you did to get to the next level, those types of things as well, was always like fascinating to me. So like being able to connect the dots with people through technology was incredibly uh, amazing. And I didn't really realize it then until like I've got later in my career. So I've always been interested in technology and just evolved it over time from kind of being very hands on and practical and actually, you know, building computing, writing, programming um, to to kind of, you know, full kind of like systems architecture and then kind of moved into kind of more of a marketing function and actually talking about technology um, and how it can actually empower people and businesses and, and actually be a, a force for good as well. So, yeah, it's been an interesting, eclectic like uh, career history, I think you could say. But I think it's a journey a lot of people who will be listening will recognize. You know, for, for a lot of people, it is that roll up the sleeves, take it apart, see what makes it work. I love that you talk about games before we were all online. You know, remember those days where yeah. you were playing by yourself in the darkened room and you had to go somewhere to be able to talk about it, you know, as opposed to what we do today. But I, I love hearing the thread of people because I do think that is a common thread for a lot more people in tech as well as it's that thread of, of collaboration, et cetera. Uh, now, I find it really interesting that you're at Nokia. Now, this is a company, not everybody realizes what a history, what a legacy Nokia has. Yeah, it's it's fascinating because, um, you know, the company's been around for 155 years. Um, and when you think about technology evolution over that period of time, it's a long, long period of time and how yeah. the company's evolved and adapted over time. And you know, many of us know uh, that that particular brand is a very, very well-known brand around the world, just more as a consumer brand, right, in terms of, you know, phones and devices. But really in recent decades, um, ever since the days of GSM, 2G technology, we've been building network infrastructure. Um, and as we've gone into 3G, 4G, and now 5G, um, and we think about how that technology is applied not just to consumers, but also to businesses as well. That really leads to who Nokia really is today, which is a B2B uh, technology innovation leader that's realizing the potential of digital in every single industry, um, particularly when networks meet cloud. We talk about that a lot um, because obviously, as, as we think about physical network infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure, that's a real sweet spot for Nokia. And Thinking about that digital transformation for businesses in that B2B world is really key. And that's who Nokia really is today. And it's interesting because, you know, I don't think people realize how old Nokia is. And, and it was technology before there were computers. And this fusion, as we work through the Gs, as that's gone through, 
the, the world that you and I remember, where you were on a computer by yourself as a separate node outside the real world to the fusion that we're talking about today, that's a huge journey to go on. And now it's hard for us to understand that not being fused together. And we have really powerful, exciting, sometimes scary things to think about the ramifications of that. Yeah, no, no, we do. And, and, and that's interesting. You talk about the fusion of digital and physical, because that, that's very much kind of how we see the evolution of technology now. It's, it's becoming you know, increasingly important that we see that fusion between uh, the physical world that we live in and the digital online world as well. And we see that manifesting itself in many, many different ways. Well, let's dig into that, because I, I think... With for you and for Nokia, what are what's the focus at the moment? What is on your desk that you're really thinking about and working on? Yeah, I think there's um, a couple of key things. So again, I talked about enterprises and the potential of networks uh, there as well. You know, there's a big topic around, and it, and it's kind of you know waned a little bit, but I think it's still important to focus on, which is the metaverse. And we talk about this in in like lots of different ways. And I know there's been a lot of hype about this, but if you really think about it in the practical sense, and, and we like to position it as kind of metaverses in plural. So we think about the consumer metaverse, which is kind of typically what's been talked about in, in the media and in the industry, where we think about completely digital worlds uh, to socialize and use gaming and, and those types of activities. But we can also think about two other uh, very concrete metaverses, if you like. So that's the enterprise metaverse and the industrial metaverse. And the enterprise metaverse is very much more about how we can increase collaboration in a particular business. So um, obviously today, and obviously uh, since, you know, a lot of remote working is happening now, you know, through video collaboration, how can we actually extend and enhance that experience? Because it's not perfect, it's a two-dimensional experience, but what could that be like for teams, product teams that work remotely? How can enterprise teams kind of collaborate together in the digital space, you know, if they're developing a product or a new service, how can you bring those teams together digitally in the, across the enterprise to kind of think about efficiencies and increase collaboration? So that's one part of the metaverse. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because, you know, bless him, Mr. Zuckerberg did bring a lot of hype to, to a noise to the system. But I think it's it's useful that that's dying down so we can start grappling with it in a real way. Because if we think during COVID when everyone had to work remotely, that burned through a lot of the myth of what that could be, but we weren't doing it properly. So this idea of now that the emergency is over, now that we're working on hybrid, really starting to grapple with that enterprise level metaverse is is quite exciting yeah it, it is and and we do see concrete examples of this happening today um at, like i said there's a lot of people in the, the automotive industry particularly or very physical industries again there where you're actually developing a product where it's very hard to kind of get remote teams together either geographically or just from a time constraint perspective um to to be able to kind of realize that and it's actually speeding up you know, product development uh, life cycle, you know, uh, of developing a product. Um, it's reducing error. Um, and then even on things like um, healthcare as well, we've actually seen uh, a lot of healthcare providers and specialists where you have very complex procedures and operations where they're actually collaborating together. There was an incredible story um, of a set of physicians and, and surgeons actually um, having a complex operation with a couple of conjoined twins. And, and they actually practice the surgery for hours and hours and hours using VR um, before they actually even got together in the operating room. They spent days and hours like collaborating on that. So that's the, that's the really powerful upside of, of collaboration in terms of the enterprise side of things. And then extending that thought of digital physical is that third element of the metaverse we talk about, which is the industrial metaverse. And again, that's more about how you can create digital twins of the physical environment that you build. So it could be a factory. Um, you, you have a lot of robotic machinery um, and automation systems there. So the operational technology side of things, if you can create a digital twin of this, you can actually then start to think about 
how do I optimize the processes in my environment? And you can track that digitally. So we talk about the, the industrial metaverse in that context. You know, can I control the physical world from the digital world? That's one other thing because that improves safety. And that's one of a lot of the things that enterprises, particularly in physical industries, um, that haven't had the opportunity to digitalize as much as other industries like retail and finance. Um, you know, we saw this again during the pandemic, right? They were able to pivot very quickly because they were already very much digitalized. They had online platforms, but the physical industries, transportation, manufacturing, energy utilities, ports, harbors, you know, they had a real challenge there because they didn't have the technology there, the connectivity, the platforms to digitalize a lot of their operational technology. And now they have that capability and that industrial enterprise and industrial metaverses, I think, are the key drivers for, for B2B um, audiences in terms of doing that at, at scale now. We can actually realize that. And that's where we think that the metaverse is really going to play strongly because businesses want to invest in those areas to become improve safety, productivity and efficiency. And that's kind of where we see the growth. Consumer will happen, I think, over time in specific elements like for gaming or for specific social platforms to do things. But I think that's maybe kind of a bit more of a mid to longer term activity as, as people start to see, yeah, it could be fun to be able to do this. But I think there's a real practical implication for businesses in the metaverse. I can agree more. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll leave Mr. Zuckerberg right. to work on the consumer <laughs> metaverse and see what he comes with. And, you know, good luck to him. But I, I, I just the more discussions I have with organizations at enterprise level. But I, I have found myself over, over the last few months being blown away at the way in which industries you just wouldn't think about thinking about that digital twinning, looking at how you model those things, really going into industries we hadn't thought about. Yep. But again, a wonderful byproduct. COVID did force that digital journey. And as a result, people are working from a really different platform than they were before. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other interesting things, so at Nokia, we've also focused about, you know, our mission statement really is, you know, we create technology to help the world act together. And, and that's really, really important because when we think about the transitions that are going on uh, of the two transitions, there's the digital transition and there's the green transition. And really there's no green without digital, right? So if you want to become green, you have to invest in digital infrastructure to kind of create that level of efficiency and productivity you want. If you want to reduce your um, we talk about kind of basically reducing our footprint. So kind of, you know, how can we become more efficient in our operations at Nokia? We want to translate that to other enterprises and businesses as well. So how do we, you know, use the life cycle of our products? How can we reduce emissions in our manufacturing facilities? How can we use uh, raw materials more efficiently for the products that we create? So that's reducing our, our, um, our footprint. And then our handprint, that the handprint when you think about it, is how you can use digitalized technologies to become more green. So what's the net effect of like not having to travel so much with teams, right? So if we can produce digital infrastructure, we can reduce travel, we can reduce time. Again, it's about reuse of resources as well to become more efficient. So kind of, you know, how do you, again, minimize your footprint, accelerate your handprint to kind of have that positive impact so that you can really think about um, that transition to, to green as well. And that that really falls with our mission statement around creating technology to help the world together. It is exciting to watch that happen. And I like the way you distinguish between the footprint and the handprint. And they both have to be put to work. It is not enough to right. just look at footprint and and if, if COVID reset us and we're starting to, to do and think about things differently, really sitting down and thinking about that handprint and how can we use digital to do things genuinely differently for efficiencies and for the climate is, is something every company needs to be grappling with today. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So I always try to then boil it down to our audience and, and the practical. All right. I, I think it's always important to look to the horizon, but then to think about, so what do I need to do? So if I'm in tech and I'm listening to us talk, what should, what should I be thinking about in relation to what you said? What should I be thinking and focusing on in relation to tech? 
Yeah, I think, again, it, it comes back to the safety, productivity and efficiency. Like what, what is the potential of the network to transform your business? Um, and if you think about, you know, start small, but think big, right? So, you know, a lot of projects, particularly IoT, I think a lot of businesses have got burnt, right? They were like, hey, we want to go all out on IoT. They've put sensors everywhere. They've got more data than they know what to do with. And it's like, what am I actually getting in return of investment on this? So one of the things to think about is as you start to connect infrastructure, whether that's your people, buildings, the, the operational technology processes, think about um, a smaller scale project where you really think it can make a difference. Is it a certain part of the production line? Is it a certain part of the, um, uh, the distribution process or something like that? And think about what are the barriers to doing that? Is it people? Is it the connectivity? Is it the platform? And think about those those kind of key elements and drive that and focus on that small project, because what you will find is that once you have that win, that we've seen this today already, where we've been talking a lot about private networks. So these are dedicated networks, um, cellular networks that sit on the enterprise's campus, the physical facilities, and it's a dedicated private network. And a great example is with um, at the Port of Southampton in, in the UK. And, and they actually wanted to, they had a problem where they had Wi-Fi throughout the port and they were using inventory scanners for to track the, the new vehicles that were coming off the roll on Moller Ferries. And they were scanning them to make sure the inventory was there. Well, they had dropout coverage. They had to make sure the ferry was right at the position of the port where it was going because otherwise the handheld scanners wouldn't work. So they had to solve that problem. So we ended up installing a private cellular network. It solved that one problem, but then they realized, hey, we've got coverage around the whole, like one and a half, two and a half square miles of the port now, this is great. So now I can talk to the folks in the warehouse about automating the, the AGVs in that part of the port. And now I can actually pr provide group communications to the folks in the back office as well. So they started expanding. They started one specific use case, one problem, but now they realize that, that investment has enabled them to actually unlock other potential business processes going forward as well. So again, that strategy around kind of starting small and then thinking big is, is absolutely the right approach. And we've seen you know, numerous successes with, with that kind of approach. So I think, you know, Jason, I, I love that you're talking about this because it doesn't always go right. You're, you're able to talk to us about some success stories, but we all know where there have been certain people that catch the hype and just want to fix everything. And like you say, sensors everywhere or people that can't look up from solving the problem to think bigger. More so than ever before, it's not just about thinking about our hardware, our software, our connectivity. It's about thinking about our people, isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, it's not, you know, just about the, the the technology. We have to think about the skill sets that that our employees have, and there's a couple of aspects here as well. So, um, you know, you need to. I think some people are actually afraid of technology. People think that technology is going to take, uh, you know, their job away. So, it, it's up to us as leaders to actually help educate the workforce a little bit more and the leaders in business to think about you know, how technology is applied, um, how it can actually help your employees as well, not, not take anything away, but actually make their lives a bit easier, um, give them more opportunity to actually grow as well. So uh, again, we've seen, even with our uh, customer service providers, our CSPs, you know, they've introduced a lot of automation into the network and things like that. They've been helping you know educate their workforce around digital tools around you know how they can use ai and machine learning to not have to sit there in front of like a knock and like look at 50,000 alarms and try and like decode every single one of them but they can use machine learning and ai to get to the most important ones and actually escalate that to solve that problem or if it's in an enterprise a similar kind of approach as well to automation so i think it's really important to think about yeah, you need to start thinking, educate the workforce on the capabilities, how it can help them. Upskilling, I think, is, a, is an interesting thing. And, and, you know, we were talking about physical industries earlier, manufacturing, ports, et cetera, energy utilities. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people there where 
they're actually the workforce is actually aging out and it's a struggle to actually either retain or get new talent in but as you start to employ these new digital technologies including connectivity um this the newer workforce is coming into play now they can actually see hey well why you you're using those digital tools you know we have a digital native generation in gen z starting to come into the workforce over the coming decade um you know they're they're digital natives they know this technology and and being able to apply that and have that mindset from the outset you know you're creating an environment for that future workforce as well so it's something that we definitely need to consider it's really thinking about both ends of that journey that I think when you look at the the older workforce, i.e. me, you, those, et cetera, that taking people on the journey to see that technology is an ally and an enabler, not the enemy, but ensuring they have the skills to make it an ally and an enabler, but but then thinking ahead for this next generation and you know as they're coming up for the workforce, making sure we keep up. But I think... If we look over the last 10 years, this upskilling, reskilling, cross-skilling is a way of life for every company now. You know, yes. woe betide the tech company, the, the CTO that is thinking, well, we'll do a year of training and then we're done. You're never done in, in relation to skills, are you? No, no, you're not. And I, I think that's the thing is like we we live in this environment now where technology is a double-edged sword, right, is that, that it does move so quickly and we talk about um, the S curve shrinking, right? So that whole notion of kind of like, you know, you, you start off with an idea, um, you've got a certain amount of time to kind of take that into the market um, before kind of, you know, you get competitors to kind of start replicating what you're doing or making another product. And and the interesting thing about technology is that it's given us a more kind of level playing field. So this is why you see so many small technology companies starting up now, because the digital tools and capabilities and the cloud and network connectivity means that they have a uh, the capability to enter the market. And it's really kind of shrunk that whole S-curve as we know it. So the time from the inception of an innovation to the time you actually get it into a product to then get it to the market, that whole notion has actually shrunk quite a bit. And I think we'll just continue to shrink. Um, so you need to kind of have a more, you know, well, dare I say it, DevOps type of mindset in terms of, you know, thinking about product evolution, going into the um, the market and actually maturing your product set. And that that's just, you know, sped up like over time that S, that S curve just continues to shrink. It's it's almost infinitesimal. It, yeah. it's, it's begun then finished before you even looked around before you had your first cup of coffee. No, couldn't agree more. So, you know, look, thank you. I've I've loved what we've done so far. We've got three metaverses to go away and think about. We've we've got to think about green tech, that thinking big but starting small, shrinking S curves. Let's Stop for a moment. I, I love to hear from guests what happens when they look beyond just their own domain, but to look at the horizon to see what, what has them worried, concerned, but what also really intrigues them or makes them happy. So yeah. taking a moment, Jason, when you're looking at the horizon for technology and as fast moving as we've said, what is it that's worrying you? What concerns you at the moment? Yeah, I, I think, again, um, yeah, you know, we were just talking about AI earlier and, and you know, kind of other things, you know, around this. I mean, you, you do see this kind of very big kind of like hype cycle about kind of, OK, it's this and it's that. And, you know, people get concerned about it. So I think there are many different regions of the world where everyone's developing their own technology at different paces and wants to apply it and use it in a different way. And I think one of the concerning things is we've done so well with technology, particularly like networks and the Internet, because we've got global cooperation. We've had the standard, standards organizations, the scientists, the academia coming together across the globe into standards forums to drive that level of standardization, which means that we can get this technology into the market. But I think the concern is that, you know, in today's geopolitical environment, if we continue to kind of look at the premise of kind of regionalization, we get a breakdown of that global standardization and that puts at risk the, the disparity in the application of technology and the capabilities that, that can actually improve for everybody across the globe. So we, we need to make sure that we continue those standardization forums and participate in those um, across every 
segment of the technology industry across every region of the globe because standardization again is what gives us scale it's what it's what gives us economic pricing from a from a product solution standpoint of view um and it gives us a, you know in terms of being able to apply the technology um you know in a faster fashion as well and not having to work through interoperability so i think i think that's the scary thing is just kind of making sure that you know, we continue to work together through the standards forums to be able to kind of develop the technology going forward. And and I think this is important. And I think sometimes it will get lost if we only leave this to countries, to geopolitical right. decision makers. And I think this is a point, and we see this more and more often for the the business market, for, for the great minds in the for-profit sector to step forward, to push on things like this, because this isn't about just competitive advantage. This is how, through that standardization, through that cooperation, it, you get the right playing field for the yeah. right kind of competition instead of these fits and starts and destructive spins that we could see coming through. Yeah. And and it's interesting because, you know, in even in our industry, we're seeing, you, you talk about um, competition and we talk a lot about now collaboration and co-optition. And we talk a lot about collaboration and it's interesting because we have collaborations with many, many big technology companies, including the, you know, the big three cloud providers. Um, but in some senses, they're also competitors to us in certain product and, and segment markets. And I think that's what we're going to just see continually going forward is that you have to look at the, the continuing market dynamics because the technology allows you to shift into adjacent markets so quickly yeah. that sometimes who is your partner could become your competitor. And then you have to think about what does that business model look like? So on the one hand, it gives you lots of opportunities, but you always got to have your head up and think about, okay, if I do um, go into bed with this partnership and I look at this, like what's what? how does that dynamic change over time? And, and we look at this constantly. And, and like this whole notion of co-optition is is I just think you know even more prevalent today and, and will continue to be going forward as those those business models get a lot more complex. And this is what I, you know because I think even the idea of a business model in the business landscape is changing. With tech, it's an ecosystem. Right. It is a dynamic, changing ecosystem. And woe betide the company that looks and says, and that's a competitor and that's a collaborator. It is much more fast changing than that, and you need that agile approach to survive and realize it's not even the enemy of my enemy of my friend is you're my collaborator you're my competitor you're both and we have to find a way of working within the ecosystem yeah. if we're both to survive couldn't agree more absolutely yeah the days of dedicated one-to-one -one partnerships where you have you know walls and structure of kind of like oh yeah I, this is this is partner number one partner number two partner number three yeah, that's just that's just not there anymore. Um, you know, you just no. you just can't work like that. Um, it's, it, you, you're not agile enough. You're not fast enough. And we again, yeah, we we touched on that S curve the other day. This is what you know a lot of like smaller companies do, right? You know, they that they're part of an ecosystem and they can actually expand very very quickly because they just adopt that whole like ecosystem approach and that's how they're able to rapidly enter a market and expand. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what we need to kind of skate towards continually. And, you know, we have had on our, on the show, several companies that have really done that exponential growth and, you know, listeners can listen to some of these other ones to hear how companies absolutely understood the power of an ecosystem and use that to really just jet power what they did. Okay, and and then think about you know is there anything on the horizon that has you excited or or really energized? Wow, yeah, I mean, I mean, so so many things. Um, I mean, I think you know we're even starting to talk about six G. Uh, so okay. so the research team at Bell Labs is actually started to um, position six G, and we we talk about the six tenants of six G, uh, which is kind of really interesting. I mean, we. Obviously, we've got a long way to go with 5G right now. Um, and we yeah. actually talk about 5G Advance, which will come out in the next two years, which just adds more capability, actually, particularly for XR and, and, and VR as well, which is which is really interesting. And also for IoT as well. There's a lot more work in 5G Advance related to what we call reduced capability devices for low-powered IoT uh, devices and sensors. So that's coming out in the next two years. And then that time frame as we start to kind of look towards the 2030 timeframe is, is when we think about 6G. 
And what's really exciting about that, we have always thought about wireless infrastructure and connectivity as just transferring data between you know, people and machines. But uh, the future wireless technology, as in 6G, will actually be able to sense our physical presence. So today we use things like you know, video cameras, audio sensors, um, even LIDAR to kind of detect like physical presence. But 6G will have this capability to sense physical presence. So we can, when you really start talking about, we were talking about digital twins earlier, if you really want to do digital twins on a massive scale, and I'm not talking just you know within a building or within a room, but like on a kind of, you know, a city-wide basis, that's where the power of um, the terahertz communication that will be uh, proposed for 6G will really come in to be able to create that sensing technology to create a digital map of the world, if you like. That's, that's kind of where we see 6G going towards the future. So that's very, very exciting. It's a long way from playing the game by yourself away from everyone else and waiting till the next day to talk to people about it. That's amazing. Listen, Jason, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of X Tech. You're welcome, Debbie. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Great to meet you. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you for listening. If you're a tech innovator and would like to appear as a guest on the show, email us now at xtech at fox.agency. And finally, Thank you to the team of experts at Fox Agency who make this podcast happen. I'm Debbie Forster, and you've been listening to the X Tech Podcast. Keep exploring the world of tech. Subscribe to our podcast and never miss an episode. To discover more opportunities for global B2B tech brands, visit fox.agency today. <laughs>